little late, Chief. A little late as usual. Well, the radio raspberry, you eh? You must have received my message or you wouldn't have come. What message? We should tell you. What the look? You don't mean this guy. That's the far-seeing gentleman who sees all, knows all, and does all. Now he's going to do all the time there is, Dr. Billy next made Way Out West when she played Wendy, a carnival man that ends up having to work off some debts on a ranch owned by Molly, played again by Leela Hyams. Naturally, he wins her over. It was, in theory, a story about a big city man that is forced to get dirty and work in the country and settles into more, quote-unquote, manly work. But according to Mann and anyone else who has seen the film, it was Billy's gayest film, i.e. it had more homosexual innuendos and overtones than any of his previous work. Most of them are subtle that someone would only notice they were in the know. Take a look at this clip. Sorry about the egg has no sex, but the banana has a peel. <laughs> Say, didn't I meet you in Tijuana? You did not. <laughs> of course not. How silly of me. But it was a girl that looked exactly like you. She had a little dimple right there, and another one had the cutest little nosy. <laughs> Now, what makes you think that's funny? Well, <laughs> all right. Shortly before that scene, Billy walks in and says, I'm the wildest pansy you ever picked. As you saw, there's only sexual innuendos. There's also sexual innuendos that were present, probably because this was a pre-code comedy. Still, Haynes is, usually, is his usual hilarious self and far more likable here than he was in The Girl Said No. As far as the homosexual references in the film, I can only assume the screenwriter wrote them for Billy to deliver either not knowing they were gay references or deliberately writing them to allow Billy to bring more of his actual self to the character. Whatever the reason, it is actually nice that he got the opportunity to almost, pl almost play a gay character at a time when that was not readily available to anyone. Though it was pre-code, there still weren't leading gay characters on the screen. The New York Times said of the film that it suited Billy's style of acting. It is an impertinent, moderately comic affair tinctured with slapstick and romance. Variety gave it better reviews, too, and pred predicted it would do the typical Haynes business. Apparently, based on these predictions and the financial success of The Girl Said No, Mayer renewed Billy's contract. However, Way Out West was not a huge hit, and while it made a profit, it was the lowest profit of all of his starring vehicles thus far. Remote Control in 1930 was his next film, and though it got better reviews and did better at the box office than Way Out West, excuse me, it still wasn't a blockbuster. By this point, Billy had lost his top spot at the box office to Charles Farrell. Mann argues that it could have been the public beginning to suspect something about Billy's sexuality and or Way Out West had stayed too far from Haynes' profit formula type of film. It also could have been that Eve Golden was correct that his wisecracking persona just wasn't translating well to the talkies. I personally think it was, again, the quality of his scripts that were bringing in less money and lowering his popularity. His films just weren't of the same quality as they once had been. MGM production, the chief, Irving Thalberg, sensed a change was needed and tried to market Billy as a more sophisticated ladies' man, more similar to the type of roles that were beginning to be played by Cary Grant and Gary Cooper, to hopefully draw more interest from female moviegoers. They even had him study his lines with Leslie Howard to come across as a more gentleman on the screen. The Taylor Made Man and Just a Gigolo were the resulting films. While they weren't profitable and got good reviews, I'm sorry, while they were profitable and got good reviews, they still didn't become the blockbusters that MGM hoped they would be. However, Billy proved that he was capable of playing very different types of characters, just as convincingly as he could his former cocky, wisecracky, wisecracking ones. He was still funny, but according to Mann, it was more gentlemanly and can be than it was arrogant and physical. The New York Times said of Just a Gigolo, William Haynes gives a, a really good performance in the film. His acting is more subdued than has been in any of his other productions, and the result is that this feature is highly amusing entertainment. Also, most importantly to Billy, he served as a set designer for Just a Gigolo. More about why this was important later. However, in the meantime, Billy went on a vacation with his all-but-legal husband, Jimmy Shields, and then came back to MGM in 1931 to rather icy waters. Apparently, according to Mann, there had been some sort of scandal involving Billy's sexuality. Whatever happened, MGM dropped his contract only to rehire him at a pay cut. Mann hypothesizes that MGM was probably just trying to humble Billy and get him to play the game, or stay in line, and act heterosexual. He was put in his next picture, The Adventures, I'm sorry, The New Adventures 
of Get Rich Quick Wallingford as the title character supported by the hilarious Jimmy Durante. The script further evol evolved Billy's new screen persona, still more of a mature adult character, but also a fast-talking con man along the lines of those roles played by Lee Tracy. MGM and the press thought that Walling Wallingford would revitalize Billy's sagging popularity. It was a good role for him, and he of course knocked it out of the park. Take a look at this clip. Is this for money? Oh, no. Personally, I never play for money. You see, is that fine? Yeah. Well, we're playing poker. I wouldn't mind having a little bet on what I've got right here. Now, let me see. <laughs> You'd lose. As you saw, Billy's Wallingford is pretending to be naive so that he can savagely take this man for all of his money in a card game. He seems at ease in this new type of con man role and could easily have had a success with it. The film got good reviews and turned a profit, more than any of his previous talkies, but it still was not the blockbuster that the studio had hoped it would be and that he needed, really. And according to Mann, it was one of his most successful talkies. Furthermore, Mayer had also begun freezing Billy out, even more recently. In addition to dropping his salary, he declined to invite Billy to various studio functions. Billy next was handed the script, Are You Listening, in 1932, which did not get good reviews and only turned a small profit at the box office. However, modern film historians, like Eve Golden, call it some of Billy's strongest work, and I agree. It's more of a straight dra drama sorry, where Billy plays a radio man falsely accused of murder. Take a look at this scene. Miller, whose voice you just heard, is right this minute a captive in the office of the Miami Clarion, awaiting New York detectives who will bring him back to justice. The woman in the case, Laura O'Neill, will be brought back with him. And together, they will face trial for a horror murder unparalleled in the crime. What have we ever done to him? What have we ever done to him? Don't do that! Bill, don't! I didn't know this wasn't on the level. I wouldn't be mixed up in a thing like this. That's a real hookup. Bill Grimes, signing off. As you saw, Billy as Bill, along with Madge Evans as Laura, are about to be taken in for a murder even though they are innocent. This film has some of that old Haynes emotional magic that I always talk about and enjoy so much in his silent films, but this time, the entire film was like that. It was dramatic. It was a dramatic vehicle that more than exhibited Billy's considerable emotional abilities as an actor. He exudes disillusionment and subtle disbelief that him and his love are being wrongfully accused of this murder. He even gets to let out a wisecrack at the end, but one that is so somberly delivered that it is almost heartbreaking. I cannot rec recommend Are You Listening Enough? It's free to watch on YouTube. Please watch it, as I think it is perhaps Billy's strongest work as an actor. The disillusionment in his character in the film is all the more heartbreaking when you realize how it was echoing the disillusionment in Billy's real life as a following film star. He made just one more film at MGM, 1932's Fast Life, which had him back at being a fast-talking con man with a brilliant sense of humor. The film even got good reviews from New York Times and Variety. However, Variety also pointed out that it was clear Billy's career was still slipping. MGM did very little to promote the film, and Billy claimed they even marketed it and, and sent it out to theaters as a B-picture. Also, by the end of 1932, Billy was through at MGM. Some could argue that it was his sagging popularity and lack of money-making power that led to Louis B. Mayer to not renew his contract. But the truth of the matter was that Mayer had finally decided to give Billy an ultimatum about his homosexuality. He ordered him to give up Jimmy Shields and get married to a woman or lose his career. MGM had also recently been rocked by the scandal of Gene Harlow's husband, Paul Byrne's suicide, and rather than, be, than, rather than be sympathetic to poor Gene or to Paul or have any human feelings at all, Mayer decided to make a clean morality sweep of his studio and get rid of anyone that could hurt the studio's rec uh, reputation as being one full of moral, upstanding people. Ramon Navarro, also gay, su suffered a similar fate to Billy and had to go. Jack Gilbert, as you may remember from my previous episode, suffered the fate of being disliked by Mayer and having a drinking problem. Whatever the reasons were, Mayer was cleaning house. According to Mann and Anita Page, Billy actually considered trying to play the game and pass as a straight man early in 1932 when he, in desperation, proposed to Anita. She decl kindly declined and probably saved her and Billy and Jimmy's happinesses. Fueled with a new renewal of courage, Billy went to Mayer's office and told him he would not give up Jimmy and walked away from his MGM movie stardom after 10 years, thus becoming the first openly gay Hollywood actor as he refused to hide his homosexuality any longer and wanted to live out his life with the love of his life, Jimmy Shields. 